Today is September 30th, 2016, and um, I'm interviewing Gary Stringer in Taylorville, Illinois. Gary is 52 years old, having been born on June 29th, 1964. My name is Sue Burkholder, and I will be the interviewer. Um, Gary, for the recording, would you please state uh, what branch of service that you served and in what war? I served in the U.S. Navy for 10 years, and that was for uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and Operation Enduring Freedom after that. And I then, went, after separation from the Navy, I joined the National Guard for an additional 11 years and was an 88 mic or a truck driver, and that was for uh, Iraqi Freedom. Well, let's start with um, uh, you know where, where you were born and maybe a little bit about your parents, what they did, and any siblings. Okay. Uh, I was born in Sterling, Illinois, and uh, my mom was a housewife at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad worked at the steel mill in Sterling. Uh, they divorced when I was young, so my dad continued there for a few years, I believe, and then you know my mom got that job. Uh, driving truck and whatever she could do to make ends meet. We had, you know, two brothers and a, and a sister. Uh, my dad moved to Geneseo where he uh, started working for Caitlin Myers Construction and for the next 25 or 30 years he worked with them. Uh, we, my mom had various jobs from then. She got into real estate. Uh, I have two younger brothers, uh, Chad and Clay, they're twins, uh, and an older sister named Robin. and. She's only two years older than I am, and my brothers are five years younger than I am. Uh, lived in the country most of the time. We moved around a lot, being you know a single family, a single parent family, but uh, had a good time. Never, never really wanted for a whole lot, but uh, you know, just kids growing up on a farm. Sure. So. Did any of your siblings or other family members serve in the military? Both of my brothers joined the army. Uh, they joined straight out of high school, and one went infantry and the other one airborne. Chad went to the Airborne Rigger, uh, 612 Quartermasters in Fort Bragg, and Clay went to infantry and ended up in uh, a cavalry unit, Charlie 25 Cav out of Fort Hood, Texas. From there, he went on to sniper school and served in Desert Storm as well. And Chad was uh, a Rigger with the 612th, and he served in Iraq as well. But he was more in the rear echelon, but still, you know, he still he was there for. The bombing of the marine barracks he was there for the cleanup of that so nobody gets away clean <laughs> all right so you um you joined uh, the navy and um you went off to basic training so tell me a little bit about basic training those first few days basic training uh, it was i went to san diego for for naval basic training which was one of the last years they did that it was 1990. Uh, I don't know if my, my company commanders thought it was reminiscent of the movies or stuff, but yes, they did the garbage can down the, between the bunks and stuff to wake you up, and it was a real system shock to go from, you know, hair past the collar and, and, and all that to getting your hair cut and going to, you know, to the military, uh, military bearing and, and strictness and everything, but you adapt and you, you get used to it and everything went pretty well. They were, they were I think they did it just with, it's a shocker to wake everybody up and say, oh, I'm not a civilian anymore. Mm -hmm. And after that, it was nothing like that at all. But uh, there was still a lot of discipline, a lot of work, on, you know, a lot of work, a lot of work. Didn't get the weapons training I would like to have had. <laughs> no, they, they, they gave us a 22 caliber barrel and a 45 frame for weapons familiarization. But being in the Navy, I'm on board ship. I don't have no, I got need for small arms. What we need to do is learn how to fight fires. And, damage control and that kind of stuff because you don't really have no place to go if you, things fall off the money yet. Right. Um, well, while you were in basic training, was, uh, can you think of any like really memorable events that happened or maybe a, an instructor that was memorable in some way? Um, but after Bates, Carl Bates was my one of my company commanders. I can't remember the other. Uh, it was put after Aguilera. But uh, I actually ran into Pit After Bates after boot camp, and I was back in San Diego for a, a school later on after that, and 
he was actually walking past in part of a parade. Uh, I believe it was Fourth of July, and the girl I was with uh, thought it was hilarious because she says you were standing at dead attention, <laughs> and we're both in civilian clothes and everything. It was just the the association stayed there, the position of authority and everything else. So it was kind of interesting to have that, but. Sure. Uh, nothing really pleasant. I did get in a little bit of trouble in boot camp because it was the first year that they wouldn't let, any, let you smoke in boot camp. And I was a smoker when I got there. So I got caught smoking a couple times. And I got in trouble. <laughs> and uh, they have special uh, workouts for people who get in trouble. And it, it, it's disciplinary. I mean, but. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. It's like going to detention in high school. You, you don't like doing it, you got to do it. But <laughs> stay out of trouble, you won't do that. So following basic training, um, what was your specialized training in? I went to uh, Millington, Tennessee for uh, structural mechanics school for aviation and trained with the Navy, or with the Marine Corps there. They had their uh, mechanics there as well because we are intermingled so well. Spent a few months there, learned, you know, I did fairly well. Uh, well enough they gave us options, and I, I chose helicopter mechanic when we graduated. But uh, again, it, I, I, I've got, mecha I'm mechanically inclined, so learning how to, to bend metal and, and, you know, punch rivets and all that, it was it's almost second nature. It didn't take a lot to learn, so mm -hmm. I did fairly well there. Then uh, after that training, I went to the aircraft specific training, but that's when I went back to San Diego, and it's FRAMP school, the Fleet Replacement Aviation Maintenance Program, if I remember correctly. I hope I did. <laughs> but uh, we spent a few months, or a few weeks at, at Coronado Island at uh, HC-11, learning the CH-46 helicopter, just a little brother to the Chinook, they call it Sea Knight. And then we spent a couple weeks over at uh, Tussin Marine Air Base there in, in LA to learn the hydraulic systems and, and such. And uh, then went back to uh, Coronado to finish off the school. And my permanent duty station was Norfolk, Virginia, and Helicopter Combat Support Squadron 6. That was fun. <laughs> um, first, I went, when I first got there, I spent Oh geez, first nine months or so getting plane captain qualified, you know, learning the the way the ways the shops worked, um, getting used to the area, finding my way around there. I lived in the barracks, so I was a single, and uh, you know, get had to get all your qualifications done. You had to get like plane captain where you when the aircraft comes back you you can climb up on it, you do an inspection on it, you check the fluids, structure, make sure nothing broke during flight or anything like that, and basically clean up the aircraft. You know, any spills, any fluids that are gathered in the, in the it's got bilges just like a, a, a ship does. Mm -hmm. And drain all that out. Watch the aircraft, stuff like that every week or two weeks depending on where you're at. Um, but that takes a while to get all the qualifications done for that. You also have to be able to direct the aircraft into taxiing and hook up the, the test stands, like the, the hydraulic test stand, the Jenny. It provides power off the side so you can move the flight controls and such as that. They got another one for electricity. Um, got hydraulic contamination qualified because you have to check for contaminants in the fluids mm -hmm. periodically to make sure that there's no particulates that can damage the hydraulic cylinders or clogged filters and stuff such as that which was interesting. Uh, become familiar with all the hazmat that they have, all the, the chemicals and paints and oils, lubricants, greases, to know what you can and can't put together, what, you know, how long you're good for, mm -hmm. what to do with them to dispose of them. Mm -hmm. It was uh, an interesting nine months. It was a whirlwind of, of education. Uh, like my job, love working on helicopters. It'd been a lifelong dream to work on in, in aviation. Anyhow, mm -hmm. I tried to go to Spartan School of Aeronautics when I was younger, but didn't make enough money to pay for it. Didn't make too much to qualify for the aid to, to pay for those classes. But uh, you know, Navy Navy gave me that dream. Mm -hmm. So 
I was I was grateful for that. Uh, first deployment, I was on board the uh, USS Butte. We left June first of '92, I believe it was. We came back December twenty second in the middle of a hurricane. <laughs> But the Butte wasn't exactly a, a, a big ship. It was uh, right around 300 feet long. Uh, two helicopters on board, about 22 people to maintain the two aircraft between officers, pilots, air crew, uh, maintenance, and almost missed the flight to the boat because we'd been up working. And I'd gotten into my team pretty well, my, my detachment. Got to know them guys. Had you know a lot of pride in your work when you when you're doing that because if you don't, things fall apart and people people don't come back. But I'd come back to the squadron the night previously, and they were working on the aircraft. And I was like, "What are you doing to our birds?" You know, I, was, I didn't know what they were doing. And they'd found cracks in the exhaust rounds on both engines on both helicopters. So they had to do a dual engine change on both aircraft, test fly them, and everything else before we could deploy the next morning. So, me being me, uh, they had guys working there that weren't part of our crew, but I was at a, it was about midnight when I showed up. So I ran out to Dunkin' Donuts, you know, brought back a couple of big boxes of donut holes and stuff, took them into maintenance so they'd have some snack on while they're working on the aircraft. Uh, so finished packing up my stuff, brought it over, helping with the aircraft till about seven o'clock in the morning. Sat down, loaded up the aircraft. Well, loaded up the aircraft sent them off the ship to be offloaded and then log would come back because the ship would come past and we would fly out to it mm -hmm. and sat down by the coffee mess and fell asleep against the wall <laughs> and uh, somebody finally came by and kicked my feet and said dude you're gonna miss it but I rode out to the air to the ship in an aircraft packed full of boxes laying on top of the boxes <laughs> but it was the the view was was great. It, f it felt like riding a ten speed down a gravel road, though it was a little bumpy on in the helicopter. But it was the the best. I mean, to go for a flight and then to look out the window and see the little white caps on the waves as you can see the ship off in the distance. It was just neat. And as soon as we hit the deck, and I got out and had my carry on my bag with me, my my leading patty officer grabs me and said, well, we're going to put you straight to work. Somebody hit the hit the aircraft with a forklift when it landed and put a hole in the fiberglass. So my first day was 56 hours long. <laughs> so, but it was, you know, you get, you get moving, you get, the adrenaline starts flowing mm -hmm. and you don't get tired. You just, you keep going. It, it's weird, but that's the way it is. Uh, my first ship, like I said, was the AE, AE, AE 27 Butte. And uh, she was only, like I said, 300 feet long, but it was a supply ship. She had ammo, some fuel, and some groceries for the for grocery stores for the other ships. And plus, we provided their mail. And we'd bring it on board and send it to other ships out there. That's that's more satisfaction in itself too, bringing the mail out. But uh, during a vertical replenishment or what we call vert rep, you sling load the cargo in a net and you know use a pennant to attach it to the bottom of the helicopter. By there's a cargo hook in there in what we call the hell hole, which is at the center of gravity, so it's a centered load. But uh, vertical replenishment is another adrenaline rush. To run out there and stand under a hovering helicopter while the ship's underway <laughs> and attach that and it's only a six foot long piece of PVC to hit hit the hook and then come out from under it while they lift up the cargo and go away and it's it's, it's a rush I, I, I loved it it was great and we were offloading the forest all uh, we called the forest fire because the, that was a ship that, that had a, a fire on the flight deck and it actually got down into the birthing areas. It was a fuel fire. They were spraying water and foam, but the water kept washing off the foam and just washed the fuel all over. The, that's when they 
figured out don't do that. You know, it's all a learning experience. You learn from your mistakes, but uh, there were still scorch marks in the birthing compartments. You could see them on the side, of the, inside on the paint. But we were offloading that, and they had racks of 600 or 500 pound bombs, six of them in each rack. And they're defused, they're, they're capped, they're safed. And when they come in, sometimes they would skid across the flight deck to where they would set it down and release the cable. And the first time that they did it, it was funny because everybody went, you know, it's like roaches when the lights came on, everybody was just gone. I'm like, where are you going to go? If that, <laughs> I mean, we're on a 300 foot ship, where are you going to run to? And, but again, the, the adrenaline rush is going, and, uh, and they had forklifts out there pulling the bombs off, taking them back to the cargo area so that they could get them below decks and stuff. And they couldn't keep up. And I remember grabbing a pallet jack and pulling them off the flight deck with a pallet jack. It was, like I said, you, the adrenaline just starts going and you, you just, it's go, 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 and it's great and fun. But, uh, did that. Came, like I said, we came back, uh, I don't know, actually, the first cruise, it was amazing because we hit so many different countries. I mean, we stopped in Rota, Spain, Siganella, Sicily, Naples, Italy, Toulon, France, Monaco, Monte Carlo, uh, Azraq, Turkey, Alexandria, Egypt, and Hanya in Crete. Several times we were in Hanya. Mm -hmm. And did you stay aboard ship or were you able to We had liberty those were all liberty ports where uh -huh. we were able to get off and you know uh, enjoy the the area and the culture mm -hmm. and that and go go swim and snorkel and whatever. Mm -hmm. I I snorkeled everywhere I went. It was great. Uh, some of the, the Mediterranean beaches are just beautiful. Um, made my own share of mistakes in that snorkeling can be dangerous. Don't go in a cave. Don't ever go in a cave. <laughs> Uh, I found one and went through it and almost didn't fit through the other side, so yeah, don't do that. But, uh, got shore base in Crete for three weeks, that was kind of fun. We just had our helicopter at the local airport working on it there and we were supposed to transport for hearing to a political prisoner, but that got canceled. Mm -hmm. But we were already there and stuck because the ship had already left to go somewhere else. They went, they went to Morocco. But, uh, again, you know, it was fun. Shore base for three weeks. I mean, in a country, we go to work every day. We do flight ops. We do our, you know, our turn around on the aircraft. We're done by three o'clock, three thirty, four o'clock, something like that. Evening's ours. Go see the sites. Go down, visit the 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 old port that was there. Mm -hmm. It still had the old crenellated wall along the, along the shore there, where they had the old cannons and stuff like that. There was holes in it where it seen some some combat at some point. Uh, beautiful rocky beaches, the paved stone, you know, the paved brick roadways, mm -hmm. uh, the old restaurants, and of course the bars. I, I did drink like a sailor, <laughs> but you'd find places that had their own. They, they loved to see people come in. It was the end of the tourist season, mm -hmm. but to show their culture to you, you know, what their food was like, what they drank, what they ate, what they what they did with their, their work and everything else was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Did uh, you enjoy the food and the... I never ate um, calamari. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. <laughs> <laughs> everything else though was pretty decent. Um, we spent uh, some time in Bahrain at one point later on in my career where I, I had a goat burger. That was pretty good actually. They don't eat beef that much there. It's hard to raise. But uh, a goat burger with a garden was just lettuce, tomatoes, onions, and cheese and that. But it was goat cheese also. It was, it was still very good. It's all right. Um, other than that, uh, in Crete, the uh, gyros, gyros, mm -hmm. oh, every, it was like a corner shop. Every block would have a shop that was mm -hmm. selling them. And not like you get here in the States. It's lamb steaks on a vertical uh, rotisserie, mm -hmm. excuse me, and they would just slice down it and catch it right in the pita bread and it was just fantastic. 
but 50 cents a piece, you buy a half dozen on the way to work, you got lunch, you know, three bucks, you're good. It's great. Had fun. Uh, when we were coming back and we hit that hurricane, though, that was something else, because we caught up just off off Bermuda, and so it hadn't quite, I don't know which hurricane it was, I can't tell you that, I can tell you the date when we hit it, which was December 20, or 19th, and uh, 35, 40 foot seas, so <laughs> it was walking on the walls, because <laughs> it was tossing that poor ship all over the place. Um, learned how to forecastle jump, if you, if you time the ship's rocking. When it comes to the top, as it starts to drop, you can jump and you can catch the ceiling girders, which are 15 to 20 feet over your head. And you got to time it right when you drop, too, because if you don't, you'll break your legs. So mm -hmm. you drop as it drops. It makes it longer drop, but it's dropping as you hit it, so it doesn't hurt. It's just a nice. You know, had, a, had a bit of a scare during that because we started taking out water with well, like a cargo vessel on it container on the, on the fore deck broke loose and slammed the watertight door and sprung it so water's coming in and got down in one of the generator rooms and sparked a fire. But we got through all that just fine and they had damage control teams for all that. They do their job very well. Um, got back after the storm was through. Um, the tail of the ship was going underwater as we were going how severe the waves were so they had to bring the aft watch into the the uh, control tower for the flight deck and the very back of the flight deck was almost going under water and that's eight feet above the aft deck so it was quite quite rough but got back December 22nd to Norfolk dropped my leave papers and came home for Christmas with my brother because he was still stationed in Fort Bragg and I hadn't seen him for four years so good day there that was my first deployment. I mean, Alexandria, Egypt was... I didn't get to go see it. <laughs> we were, it was a, there was a storm and we got out in the boat to go on in and the waves were so rough we couldn't get to the pier so they turned us around because we were anchored out and got back on the boat. Same thing in Monte Carlo, we got to the sheriff shore. I got to go see it, but I couldn't get back on the boat. We had to get a hotel room, which was expensive. Expensive, <laughs> to say the least, because it was right on the track for the Grand Prix, right on the route they take, so it was right on the harbor. But again, the 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 places you can go see, the things you can do. I you know I went to Jacques Cousteau's uh, museum and aquarium. Mm -hmm. Awesome, mm -hmm. great stuff, but fun stuff. So okay, so you. Um Done with your first deployment, then what, what happens next? Where did you go the next? Well, um, well, we go back and we spend a year back ashore because mm -hmm. there's a rotation cycle for all that. The next deployment was on board the USS Wasp for Operation Enduring Freedom, or not, not Enduring, I'm sorry, Re Restore Hope in Somalia. So we went through the Suez Canal, mm -hmm. which was interesting. I saw my first shark there. There's a hammerhead going up the canal as we were going down. It's kind of interesting. Um, it's it's weird being on, an, on a, a ship the size of an aircraft carrier and seeing land on both sides. Mm. And it was not very wide. Uh, you couldn't have had two aircraft. Two of the ships could not have passed each other. But uh, it was kind of cool because you could sit there and watch the structures. The, there you see some mosques go by and some decorative stuff. Um, beaches. I can't remember exactly everything I had, but on the way to Somalia, we got down there, and we were just going back and forth, you know, Mogadishu, Kismayi, Mogadishu, you know, back and forth across the equator. We must have crossed it a half dozen times, so they, the Navy has what they call a shellback. That means you've crossed the equator, and there's a ceremony to go with that, or a, a, an initiation rite. I can't tell you everything that they that you go through on that because it's it's a tradition and it's held to a certain amount of, of respectable silence mm -hmm. and all I can say is it was a long day there was some mild embarrassment not huge embarrassment but it was uh, 
gratifying at the end, you know. You know, now I'm, you know you're one of the, the few that have, have done that. And it's not really all that few. It's probably half the Navy's across the equator, I would, I would say. But it was, uh, they had your, your uniform on inside out and backwards and all this stuff. And you know, T-shirts on the outside, underwear on the outside. And you had to walk in your hand, you know, move around on your hands and knees on the flight deck. And that got rough. You, you were allowed to wear gloves because of the non-skid. The peaks that they whip up in it can get quite high, but that's so the aircraft have traction and you have traction to walk on. But, but we could pad your knees and pad your hands so you didn't, you know, to injure yourself. They kept a good eye on you and made sure they didn't hurt anybody. But it's all, like I said, it's all symbolic. Mm -hmm. It's it's a rite of passage, so to speak. You go in this big tank they make, and on one side you're a polywog, you go underwater and come back up the other side, you're in a shell back. It's, it's a, a great, great day. And that was off watching the beaches go by and kiss my uh, Somalia. Mm -hmm. It was hot. That's where I learned the term Africa hot. <laughs> I learned the definition of it. But amazingly, as it may seem, we were probably a mile and a half offshore, and we had flight, we had grasshoppers landing on our flight deck. Big ones. But, Interesting. But lots of fun. We had. A lot of flight ops off that. They had Harriers on board, uh, a full contingent of Marines. About I think we had 4,000 Marines on board with the Harriers, the helicopters, uh, the Cobras, the, the CH-53s, which are big air, big aircraft. Um, had one come back. They had that. It had a mechanical failure, and they ditched it in a field. And they actually had another 53 pick it up to bring it back. All they had to do was take the rotor blades off and put them mm -hmm. inside the aircraft and sling load it and bring it back. Mm -hmm. That that's a uh, lot of a lot of power on those aircraft. We had uh, one day we were sitting out there doing our flight ops, and they brought a pallet of three quarter inch plywood to the flight deck for some reason, and a helicopter went to land just forward of it. And the wash off the rotors took it and just threw it like a stack of cards. And it was just, we were all just laughing because it was, you couldn't do nothing about it. It's too late. <laughs> I mean, hold it, hold, put your fan on high and hold a deck of cards in front of it. That's what it looked like. It was just crazy. Uh, had aircraft get away from us because in 46, when you, turn the battery on, if you haven't pulled the circuit breaker for the rotor brake that holds the rotors still, mm -hmm. it will come off automatically. The, the power search mm -hmm. flicks it off. It, it's normally in an off position. And <laughs> somebody hit it by mistake and we're moving forward in the ship so the wind is coming across the deck and it starts to the rotors turn. And the pilots bring up the uh, APU but it's not going fast enough where you can turn the brake on because it would damage the, the whole drive line because everything would just snap mm -hmm. but it wasn't going it was going too fast for him to start the engines and try to engage the transmission <laughs> so we're out there with ropes it's nighttime it's 10 o'clock at night 11 o'clock at night we're trying to get ropes up in there to catch it and drag the drag the rotors to a stop <laughs> and that's one injury I got I got hit in the eye right here by one of the clasps on one of the ropes that ended my night, but they eventually got the aircraft under control and got it all stopped. There. And, you know, so once again, you know, things just happen sometimes, but it wasn't that anybody was careless, but the wind caught the rope and brought it back at me. I turned around and by the time I saw it, it was too late, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. didn't hit in the eye, but it was close enough that it dropped me. It was wonderful times. <laughs> Watching the Harriers take off is something that it's just really cool because they take off like they'll take off with a normal aircraft because they can't take off with a full payload vertically. But when they come back and land, if they're coming back at night, you gotta see it because the, the exhaust shrouds and everything with the vector th thrust mm -hmm. is just cherry red from mm -hmm. from heat from the engines, and they're huge. I can sit up in the intake of, the, of that just the aircraft. The, the engine is so yeah. big around that Rolls Royce jet engine. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Wow. Lots of lots of power to them too. Mm -hmm. yeah, fun. <laughs>
Okay, so this was your second deployment. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and that came eventually to an end. And Actually, we ended up going from there up into the Persian Gulf for a while. Uh, okay. Um, went to Dubai and Bahrain, uh, Abu Dhabi, did some patrols. Yeah, we did some patrols up in there a little while. I could see the, the oil wells burning at night. You could see the smoke. There was still oil floating on the water. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to remember if that was on. Oh, no, that was my house. I, I've been there a couple times on, on different ships. Um, we just, you know, we didn't have, it was pretty uneventful. We had, uh, we were looking for sanctions violators mm -hmm. and making patrols, you know, sending aircraft around just for visual. Um, didn't do a whole lot of, of anything on that, you know, again, patrol, that's about it. Mm -hmm. and we went back to Norfolk after that. Um, wasn't a very long turnaround that time and we got put on board the USS Saipan to go down to Haiti for humanitarian relief, but we didn't quite get there. <laughs> we got down there, we were maybe two days from, from being down there, and somebody had dared me to shave my head for some reason, and I'd accept it for some other reason, and I'd just taken the first swipe out with my trimmers to take it down to the skin. And our chief comes in and says, we're going home. <laughs> I was like, oh, what? <laughs> we're doing what? No, no. Because I had this one big hit reverse mohawk. And he just looked at me and shook his head and walked out. Funny as all get out. Uh, we were sitting back there. Some of the people that we work with, though, the pilots, the, the officers, really good guys. Uh, last name. Uh, one lieutenant was one of, I wouldn't call him, I can't call him a friend because he, you know, the, the structure, but one of the guys I respected most, and now I can't remember his last name, and it was just in my head, not left, because I thought about it. Uh, I, Robert and Bobby, occasionally you'd see them out in the world, and they'd say, don't call me by my, you know, we're in a foreign country, don't say sir, don't say lieutenant, mm -hmm. you know, Bobby is fine, mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, but I remember one night I'm working on my aircraft and we're doing a flight control phase which you take out all the fl flight control bolts, inspect them, clean them up, replace them, retorque them and everything else. I'm up there doing that and my commanding officer came out. I'm an airman, I'm an E3. And uh, he asked what's going on. I said, well, you know, we're just doing our, doing our maintenance and everything else. I said, oh, well, all right, well, then I'm going to go home. I'll see you later. This is permission, or permission granted. Carry on, sir. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Turned around and looked up, shook his head and walked back out. <laughs> it was just, but he was, you know, uh, Mentor Dowling. And he was, you know, once again, great guys, but they, you got to know the pilots that you're working for too, and they want to know their maintenance guys, and know that they can, you know, put trust in what they, what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all, it's all about being, being able to be trusted with what, what they put in your hands. Yeah. Did you make friendships during your um, time in the service that um, even lasted beyond? No, no. I, I I don't didn't form that kind of relationship, and I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. But I haven't formed that kind of relationship with, even in high school. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I I've never been that that type of person. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, I got a lot of people I remember that I think remember fondly of, but uh, you know, I just don't have that. I mean, my brothers, they've got people that, since uh, Chad, that was airborne, retired from the Army after 26 years in 2013. And he's still got guys that he went boot camp with that he still writes and corresponds with and talks to on the phone and computer and such. My other brother, Clay, got out after, I think he's seven years in, but he'd been a sniper in Desert Storm. And he still has people that he talks to that, you know, he maintain relationships with that, with that, but I've never been that close to anybody. You know, I've just never got there. <laughs> you know, That's right. I, I was a skinny little redhead dude in high school. It was always new in school because I went to six different schools with a name like Stringer and Redhead. Mm -hmm. yeah. Carrot Top. Mm -hmm. my, co my coach called me in wrestling, so, mm -hmm. so there you go. But, yeah. 
just never got to form those relationships. Um, so, okay, was that, um, let's see. That was still in HC6 in Norfolk. Yeah. Um, I rotated to shore duty after that. Um, got transferred to HSL 42 mm -hmm. in Mayport, Florida. It's part of uh, Jacksonville, okay. right outside of Jacksonville. Went down to Naval Air Station Jacksonville School to learn how to work on the, the sea, Seahawk, mm -hmm. which is a search and rescue platform. They were using that, talking about replacing the, the 46 with that, but uh, if that came to fruition or not, I don't know at this time. I haven't paid that much attention to it. But uh, learned my school there in Jacksonville and went to Mayport and joined my new squadron there. Um, went to deployment in there. I was on another trip to uh, Samuel B. Roberts for another deployment. We went to the Gulf again. And it wasn't really an eventful thing. Mm -hmm. you know, so that was doing patrols and everything else. Mm -hmm. It was either, either that or it was in HSL 42 that I did that and I can't remember which one it was. It's just been too long. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, it wasn't 42 because we had the Seahawks then. I had uh, they had a FLIR on the on the front. They had just put on there the forward-looking infrared, and they were using that to look up the rivers mm -hmm. to see if there were sanctioned violators coming down. Mm -hmm. But they could were trying not to go too far into their airspace. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did find a derelict air, air sailboat one time that had been washed out to sea on a in a storm, which was interesting. Ah, the new the skipper's new gig, you know. <laughs> but. Uh, Pretty uneventful there. We had we were, we were confiscating sanctions violators. Any oil tanker coming out, we would bring them under our control and take them to Bahrain or Dubai or wherever they were taking them to take them. I don't know what happened mm -hmm. after that. But, uh, lots of lots of time, lots of fun, lots of lots of aircraft time, lots of time on the flight deck. Mm -hmm. Trying to use the Seahawk for a vertical replenishment. The guys there had always been on Seahawks. They didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. They weren't familiar with it yet. I came from a platform that just did that, so they put me out on the flight deck lot. But then they started to tell me I didn't know what I was doing. You can't do it that way. But you've never done it. How do you, do you know how to do it? <laughs> you've got to have somebody grabbing onto you. No, he gets in my way. If I need to move out of the way, I don't want somebody hanging onto me, stopping me. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of stuff. They, they, they were calling it safety. I'm saying you're an obstruction. You're not safe. You know, you're not being safe about it, but I didn't have enough chevrons on my shoulder to make the call on that. But there I did make my my E5 with that, that command. Uh, got to be quality assurance, got to be safe for flight, was in charge of tools, hazmat, uh, a lot more responsibility. Mm -hmm. Still, I, I had a lot of good times in there, too. Went to Fort Lauderdale, went to uh, St. Thomas. Got to meet Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg when we were on board the USS Normandy the last year I was in. Uh, they did that ceremony in 1999 for the honorary awards they gave to Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg for doing Saving Private Ryan. Yes. And since it was the Normandy named after the beaches you know, from D-Day, they thought it was an appropriate setting. So mm -hmm. it was pretty cool to meet them, get autographs from them for you know, whatever you want. I had a videotape. Of Saving Private Ryan, this autograph that my white hat and all that. It's pretty cool. Me, the DreamWorks guys, worked with them. Mm -hmm. uh, came back and my 10 years was up, and I was tired of being away from family so much. So mm -hmm. that was when I got out, got my honorable discharge, came home and joined the National Guard. Uh, that was a 1644 transportation company out of Rock Falls. Learned how to drive truck. <laughs> uh, the 915A1s is what we had, and it's a semi, you know, just a standard road semi. But the military grade ones, there's no air suspension. It was all spring ride, the, you know. But uh, during my time with them, in 2003, we got activated for uh, Iraqi Freedom or Enduring Freedom, and. We were only activated for three months and they canceled our activation and sent us home. 
then in 2004 we got activated again. We had gotten new trucks too, so we now had the 915A3s, which were built by Freightliner, which had air ride seats, had air conditioning. I mean, it was very nice, very comfortable truck to ride in. And we went and did our one year in Iraq. Uh, that's one year in country. Not they've changed that since then. Now it's one year total deployment. But ours was you had two to three months of workups to get everything set, get all your training done, get your your equipment ready to go and then they ship everything over and as soon as you hit your feet on the ground in Iraq that's when your year started. <laughs> Made for a long year. Uh, incredibly hot, dry, but when the rains hit, they hit. I mean there was no doubt about when, when, the, wet, when the weather hit wet, it was nasty bad. Uh, and what was it like um, living in that environment then? Like, what were your accommodations? We had tents for the first nine months. Mm -hmm. They were uh, insulated, though they had two layers to them. We had eight air conditioners in the tents to help keep it cool. They put them up on uh, pallets on plywood platforms so they would stay up out of the sand and keep some of the bugs and snakes and mm -hmm. such down. They were pretty comfortable. We had 20 guys for, for you know, top and bottom bunks, almost mm -hmm. like being here. but. Uh, just, uh, I don't know, it was hot. <laughs> uh, we were there, I was stationed in Arafjan, Camp, Camp Arafjan in Kuwait. It was still being built while we were there. That's why we were in tents for the first nine months. They ended up building us a barracks to put us in, mm -hmm. but we didn't get there until the last three months. So it's like, there's no internet, there's no, you know, there was no computers, there was no... TV to speak of, and we started, there There was a PX where you could buy your stuff, you could buy computers, Xboxes, TVs, anything you wanted, Be DVDs coming out your ears. I mean, I bought seven seasons of Stargate, right? So <laughs> uh, bought a laptop, bought some speakers, and had, so I could have music and such, watch my TV or whatever. Um, one guy had a brainstorm, let's get satellite internet because the uh, internet for emails back home and stuff, mm -hmm. communications, it's good. So we all pitched in and bought a satellite dish and everything and, and subscribed and we must have had a hundred people or so paying for the for the internet and we had Wi-Fi set up throughout our section of the tent. We had 22 tents, we had Wi-Fi set up through them so we could, anybody could get on their laptop, do their email, we had the, everything hardwired so if you didn't have Wi-Fi very good, you'd get on the hard line and do that. But since we had hard wires from every tent, let's network our Xboxes. <laughs> so we had Halo Wars going on. This is old 2004, 2005. I mean, we had a we had a network set up. Every tent had a hard wire going to it. We had tent versus tent because some tents had four and five Xboxes in them, all networked together. So it was just it was a lot of fun that way. That's that's to unwind between missions. I mean, when we got there, there was still almost 100 miles of dirt road to drive them semis on to get, you know, because we'd run supplies up. I mean, I had to refresh my memory before coming in here, and I think I, my paperwork said I had 32 missions and ran 13,757 miles in Iraq. So the average driver in the U.S. used to be 10,000 miles a year average use on a vehicle. So we, we surpassed that and I didn't go on every mission. You know, there are people that had more miles than I did. But, you know, bringing containers of food, uh, personal hygiene items, stuff for the commissary, mm -hmm. stuff for the chow hall, munitions, I mean, any, anything and everything we'd, we'd haul. Uh, 118 armored personnel carriers, sure, throw them on, we'll go. I mean, but it gets, it's discouraging sometimes when you get, somebody gets hurt or something happens and you find out you were carrying a load of styrofoam food containers to go trays or a roll, you know, a load of, of toilet paper. And you, you think about that and it's like, really, we're hauling that? That's what this guy got hurt for? Well, you gotta think about it. 
you, if you if you don't take what you've got to where the front lines are, they can't do their job. You know, without their even the to-go trays. Well, what do you think we brought your lunch to when we got to that base? A to-go tray. So, you know, everything everything was essential. You just had to look at the bigger picture of it and not think of it just that item. It's everything put together. Um, we had a good year overall. We did have a casualty. It's been eleven years, you think of you know. I wasn't on the convoy that it happened on, but uh, a young lady by the name of Sergeant Hosby was killed by a roadside bomb. The shrapnel came in, got between the lacing of her body armor. She was doing a right seat ride, training our replacements. Well, training other people coming in because we would teach them, you know, how the, how the convoys work, how you got to stay, you know, one behind the other, try to maintain speed, and distance, and everything. And the roadside bomb hit the fuel tank, and she was 24 years old. But for as many miles as we put in, to come back with only one casualty is, is saying something. Uh, sorry. She was a friend. I helped her get her sergeant strips. So. I help, you know, you, you teach people. I, I, I came, we came back from that in 2005, where I went on to get my instructor certificate to teach people, you know, and more people how to drive truck. I, I was good at it. I was good at teaching people how to back up and how to control the vehicle. I had my share of accidents, trust me, but you learn from your mistakes and go on. Uh, I was medically retired in 2011. September because I have torn in meniscus in both my knees. I've got a bad back you know, from being in a gun truck. I didn't tell you about that. Half my time in Iraq was spent in a convoy escort platform from a gun truck and uh, wearing a body armor and Kevlar, standing in a vehicle that had been had armor bolted onto it. The suspension was not designed to handle, just beat the tar out of a person. But. Uh, it injured my back. I'm still working on that with the veterans group. I'm trying to get that straightened out with the VA. But uh, it will come in due time. But at least I retired. I'm done with that. And 21 years of meeting a lot of people, doing a lot of things that other people can, can't say they got to do. Uh, going places that I never thought I would see ever in a lifetime and no regrets some things I would do maybe yeah but that's not my call I can't bring her back so that's about the only I wish I was still in the Navy it'd still be fun <laughs> sometimes you miss what you let go of but, uh, so what is the most positive thing that you took away from your experience in the service I think I can do just about anything I set my mind to. But you know, if I want it bad enough, I'll get it. You know, I'll I'll, I'll do. I can do anything. You know, I was I almost ended up not graduating high school, but then I can go on to be you know well traveled, well educated. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just because I didn't like doing homework. I didn't like where I was. You know, like I said, I was always new in school and everything. 
there. I went to see six different schools, I think. I was real clean one of my five different schools before I was in eighth grade. So, you know, it takes, it's hard to adjust when you're not used to it. And I always lived out in the country, so I wasn't used to being around other kids, you know, just, just what family you had. So it was, that's what probably developed my character where I don't maintain those long lasting relationships. But I didn't do too bad either. Like I said, I don't think I have any regrets. All right. Is there a message you would like to leave for future generations who might see or view, hear this um, interview? Do the job. Don't be scared. Um, and don't forget your family, because without them you couldn't do any other. Family, friends, co-workers, people you work with, serve with, in, in service and out. I mean, it takes all of us to make everything work. Nobody can do everything themselves. Uh, <laughs> serve as long as you want, because anything over a day is good. Well, I want to thank you very much for taking time out to speak with me about your experiences, and thank you for your service to our country. Thank you.